All right, hello everybody and welcome to our final webinar at Mighty Cause for 2020, 2020, which is all about email marketing for year-end fundraising. My name is Linda Gerhardt and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. Um, and I've been with the company since 2016. And one of the hats that I actually wear for the, our, this company is email marketing. I manage our email marketing for Mighty Cause. Um, and before coming to Mighty Cause, I did actually manage email marketing for the nonprofits that I worked for. So hopefully uh, that I can bring that experience and help you uh, put together a really strong um, end of year email marketing plan. Um, here's a quick look at today's agenda. It doesn't look that intense, but there is a lot of information for you in this webinar. Uh, I'm going to go through some uh, email marketing basics just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then we're going to move into some specific emails that you'll want to plan with tips and best practices for each. Um, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you think of something you'd like to ask while I'm presenting, just pop it into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel and we'll make sure that we have time to get to it at the end. So to start with, I want to review some email marketing basics just so that we're all on the same page and I don't lose anybody who's maybe new to email marketing with terms that you're not familiar with. Just want to make sure that we're all on the same page with the basics. Um, so as most of you know, December is a very important month for nonprofits um, as an estimated 30% of all charitable giving happens in the month of December and a significant percentage of that giving happens just in the last few days of the year, year, I believe the final three days of the year. Um, so where are those donations coming from? Um, across the nonprofit sector, uh, surprisingly to me, direct mail marketing is the source of most of the donations in December, um, but email is a close second. Uh, so people are opening envelopes that they get in the mail um, and opening emails in their inboxes to donate to their favorite causes. Um, the source for those, uh, that piece, those pieces of information is Charity Navigator. An email is important because it is a direct line to your supporters. Um, unless you send an email to an invalid email address or your email accidentally ends up in the spam folder, um, you're guaranteed to land directly in their inbox. So there's no algorithm to stand on in your way from talking to your supporters like there is on social media. You don't have to wonder if you'll be seen. Um, and most people will see your email and have to make a decision about it, whether that's to open it or to trash it or ignore it. So you will end up in their inbox if their email address is accurate. Uh, so that gives you an advantage over a lot of other forms of fundraising. Um, and even though direct mail marketing reigns supreme in December, a lot of small nonprofits just don't have the budget for a direct mail marketing program. Um, it involves hiring a company and it's an ongoing expense. So for smaller nonprofits, email marketing is where it's at. That is your number one way to connect with donors and ask them to donate in December. And finally, the year is ending, obviously, and donor retention is a really important measure of your fundraising health. Uh, so December is your last chance to engage donors who are in danger of lapsing. So donor retention is also a huge piece of uh, email marketing in December. Um, so I did wanna move on to some uh, information that's a little bit technical and in the weeds regarding email marketing um, so that we're all just starting from the same place of understanding. Uh, the first thing I wanted to discuss is a call to action, which in email marketing is often shortened to a CTA. Um, a call to action is basically whatever it is you're asking people to do when they read your email. And one of the ways you'll measure an email's success is by looking at how many people actually clicked and did the thing that you were asking them to do. Um, so obviously your CTA pretty much across the board for the month of December is going to be to donate to your nonprofit. Um, in most cases, especially with email marketing, um, the CTA takes the form of a button. You can see some examples of some common buttons on the slide here, um, which takes the user to a landing page where they can do whatever it is you're asking them to do, which for our purposes is going to be a web page where they can complete a donation to your nonprofit. 
The CTA button is a really key part of your email and things like the color of your button and the location of your button in the email can all play a role in whether or not people are likely to click it. There's a lot of great information that's just free on the web about CTA buttons and how to format them and optimize them. Um, but we'll talk a little bit in a bit about how you can optimize it for your specific audience. But CTA buttons are really important in email marketing. They're kind of the centerpiece of your email because that's where you will, where people will go to do the thing that you're asking them to do. Segmentation is a word uh, you'll hear email marketers say quite a bit, and certainly if you read Mighty Cause's blog post or you've attended other webinars of ours where we've talked about email marketing, you've probably heard us say it before as well. Um, and segmentation is basically just taking your whole email list and you're splitting it into groups based on affinity or the things that are alike with the people in the groups. Um, in most nonprofit contexts, this is going to be done based on user behavior, like what kind of donor they are and the level of involvement they have in your organization. So when you've got your different groups or your segments, they're identified and they're sorted, you're just going to tailor your emails to be specific to them. And just to make this totally clear, in most cases, you're not just going to be creating a whole new email just for that segment, but you're going to be taking a general email that you built, like a blast that you would send to your whole list, and you're just going to be tweaking it a little. So just to give an example, if you're sending out a December 31st email, one of the segments you may want to pull out and contact a little bit differently is donors that you have not retained yet for 2020. Um, you may want to add a little bit of extra urgency or say something like, you showed up to support us in 2019 and we're asking you to help us again in 2020. Um, so you can use language like that. These are not huge uh, edits to your emails. They're just small tweaks that make it a little bit more specific to your audience. Um, you may also want to pull out your volunteers and talk directly to them so that you can add in some, some words about the uh, hard work that they do for your nonprofit all year um, and that thanks them for that. So you're not reinventing the wheel for each segment. You're making these small tweaks that make an email more personalized and make it more likely to land well with the people who receive it. Um, in terms of what kind of segmentation you want to aim for at year end, I've outlined a couple of key segments for you. Um, again, volunteers and donors have a lot of overlap, so identifying the volunteers on your email list is really helpful so you can make sure that your volunteers feel seen and appreciated. Um, your recurring donors are a group that you'll want to talk to a little bit differently than your whole list because these are people who give on a monthly basis to your organization. Um, you can also pull out specific types of donors, like people who gave in December 2019, um, but haven't given, it, given yet this December, um, people who gave to your Giving Tuesday campaign, um, and donors who are in danger of churning, which would be donors who gave in 2019, but have not yet made a gift in 2020, since this is really your last chance to prevent them from churning. Um, and retain donors so that you can acknowledge the fact that they have already given in 2020, and you can maybe change up how you ask, like maybe add something like, we know we can count on you, because that's true, you can count on them, they've already donated to you this year. Um, adding a little bit of segmentation really does go a long way to uh, making your email strategy more robust and making your emails a little bit more likely to land well with the people who are receiving them. <coughs> Pardon me. So on that note, I did want to let you all know that Mighty Cause has actually just released this week a really cool new, new integration that's available now. Um, we literally just released it, I believe, on Tuesday. So you guys are actually the first to know. Um, we have a MailChimp integration now. Um, and the reason we built this is that when we surveyed our users earlier in the year, uh, MailChimp was far and away the most popular email marketing product that Mighty Cause users also use. Um, this integration is available to advanced subscribers. That's a subscription for $99 per month. Um, and if you are an advanced subscriber, this is already available to you. It's on your dashboard. And if you're not an advanced subscriber yet, you can actually get a free trial of advanced if you're interested in taking it for a test drive. Um, the cool thing about free trials on Mighty Cause is that you do not have to give us your credit card. Um, when your trial is up, you will have the choice 
to uh, you know get a subscription if you would like to, but you're, we're not going to charge you if you opt not to. Um, so what the integration actually allows you to do is connect your MailChimp account to Mighty Cause so that you can sync your contacts, uh, create and add audiences in MailChimp, um, add custom fields and tags, which is how you can sort of note which group or segment a donor is in, or just pull out pieces about that donor that you would want to have stored in MailChimp. Um, and it just makes segmentation a million times easier, saves you a lot of time and manual work by automating this for you. So again, um, this is available now to advanced subscribers on Mighty Cause, and if you don't have advanced yet, you can just go to your dashboard today and activate your free trial if you wanted to test it out through the end of the year. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that this is available to you. This is actually a little bit of an exclusive announcement. Um, so hopefully you guys, if you're MailChimp users, you can go take advantage of this integration. All right, so next up is A-B or split testing, which is basically how you would go about determining what the best color and placement for your CTA button is, or what kind of subject line works best to get people to open your emails, um, or even what time of day is best for opening your emails. That's a, a really common question about email marketing. What is the best time to send emails? And A-B testing is a really great way to find that out and to gather that data. Um, so A-B or split testing, tests, they're kind of the same thing. They're just variable tests. So you're taking your group of email contacts and you're randomly splitting them into groups, usually two of them in a 50-50 split. And one group, group A, gets one variation of the email and the other, group B, gets a different version of that email. And what you're doing is you're looking at the results and comparing them to see if one email was more successful. So you're basically gonna wanna test one variable at a time. Um, because if you test five different things in you know, one 50-50 split, you really won't have any idea what caused one email to be successful over another. So you kind of just wasted your time because you had too many variables. So you wanna keep it to one variable per test. Um, <clears throat> so you wanna keep them pretty simple, and this is a really great way to get data about how your, uh, your subscribers interact with your emails and what works best with them. Um, a lot of this, there's uh, you know some best practices across the field of email marketing, but this is the best way to get data about how your subscribers act because every uh, subscriber list is different. Um, what applies to uh, you know retail customers may not apply to nonprofit donors. So this is a really great thing to consider doing, especially, especially as we go in to those key uh, three days at the end of the year. Um, there are a couple of things that are really important to split test and have data on, as I mentioned, especially as you go into the end of the year and these really critical emails that you're going to send out. Um, the first is a subject line. Um, now, this can be a little bit tricky because in most cases, you're not going to test a subject line and then use that exact same subject line in an email later that week. Um, but, for, but one thing that you can test for is format of your subject line. So for instance, you may want to find out if donors respond better to a question versus a statement. Um, so you'd want to change up the subject line and have maybe, will you help us versus we need your help. Um, so you could do a 50-50 split and test that out and use that knowledge to build your subject lines for the last few days of the year, since those are gonna be your key emails. Um, obviously, the metric that you'll use here to determine which one was the better option is how many people open your email, um, which is super important because if people don't open your email, then all of the work that you do creating content is basically useless. You want them to open the email. And another thing that you can test that is uh, emojis. So one of the things that is true in general across email marketing is that people are more likely to open emails with emojis in them. Um, so you can sort of see if your audience responds in that way as well, like, you know, put a little snowman email in the uh, emoji in the subject line and see if that helps get more opens. Um, it is pretty consistent that it does help, but based on your nonprofit, you may want to test that out before you, you throw an emoji into one of your key 
email subject lines. Um, as I mentioned before, you may also want to test your CTA button so that you can optimize for the final week of the year. Um, location is a really big thing to test. That's probably the most common thing that people test. Um, so you may want to try putting a CTA button in the middle of your content, like between paragraphs, um, and then have another email where the CTA button is at the end, right after all your content, and see which one results in more clicks. Um, you can also choose to test the color of the button and the text. Um, you can fiddle around with the wording you use, like testing please donate versus donate now. Um, A-B testing is really cool because it allows you to take a data-focused approach to your email marketing and helps you understand the behavior of the people on your list. Um, and that's almost always a helpful thing to do if there's an internal debate about a subject line or where your button is, if you have a disagreement with someone about what's best, uh, you went in doubt, just do a split test, don't fight about it, um, and then you have the data and you can say, actually, this is better, and here's the data to prove it. So that's also a really uh, a cool way to settle um, an internal debate about what to, to put in the subject line or where to put the CTA button. So before we move on, I did want to go through some common email marketing terms. So if I use them later on in the webinar, I won't lose anyone. Um, open rate is pretty self-explanatory. It's something that an email marketing program like MailChimp or Constant Contact will calculate for you. And it's just the percentage of people who opened your email. Um, so that's important. You want them to open your email. So looking at your open rate, the number of people who are opening your email is, is a great way to see if your emails are being successful. If you're not finding that they're open very much, then you may want to uh, do some testing related to your subject line or change up your subject lines. Um, Click-through rate or CTR also is something that your email marketing programs will calculate for you. And it's also pretty easy to understand and self-explanatory. It's just the number of people who clicked on a link in your email. Uh, now, most email marketing programs will give you a CTR for the whole email that, ma that measures every click. But if you're looking to see how many people clicked on something specific in your email, like your CTA button, you'll likely need to drill down into the data a little bit more to find out, for instance, if your CTA button was being effective because most of us have links in our email that go elsewhere. They'll go to our website, they'll go to our Facebook page and so on. Um, so you'll get all of those captured in a CTR in most cases, but if you're looking for a specific part to make sure that people clicked, you'll have to drill down a little bit further. Um, a conversion is basically when somebody takes a desired action and completes the thing that you want them to do, which for end of year would obviously be completing a donation after receiving an email asking them to make a donation. So a conversion is they fully completed the task. So a click would not necessarily be a conversion because they wouldn't, we don't know if somebody clicked on a link if they actually made a donation, but a conversion is when somebody actually completes the, the process of doing what you asked them to do. Uh, personalization in the context of email marketing means inserting variables into an email that pull in specific pieces of data from your email list. So this would be an area where a custom field, like the ones I mentioned that we have have through our MailChimp integration come into play. Um, an easy personalization would be a donor's first name so that you can start the email off saying, hi, Susan, or you know, thank you for being a donor, Susan. Um, but you can also use personalization in really creative ways um, that would make your email more effective. Um, for instance, pulling in the amount of their last donation or even the month of their last donation, so that you can build a more personalized, uh, specific email. Um, now, the caveat here is that in order to make this work, you need to actually have the data in whatever email marketing program you're using, and you'll need to map it into your email, um, which can be a little bit tricky, uh, but most email marketing programs have their own method for doing this. Uh, you basically insert the variable into the email and tell it what information to pull from the list, um, usually a custom field and um, it, it'll pull that. You can find uh, resources on that in, in support libraries most of the time. Um, <clears throat> and the last per term that's related to personalization is a fallback. Um, and a fallback is a fail safe in case there is no data for a particular user and you've inserted a personalization field. Like for some reason, if you don't have a user's first name in your email list, you can set a fallback to say something like friend 
or value donor or whatever you choose just so that the user doesn't see a broken personalization variable or get an email that says hi first name because that's not a good look and that's a nightmare as an email marketer so just make sure if you're using personalization that you have a fallback so another example of that would be if you were pulling in their last donation amount um, and if you don't have data for that particular user you can have a fallback of your donation or your generous donation and just make sure that that makes sense in the context of your email so that your email still makes sense when the user or reads it, even if they don't have uh, information in that particular spot. All right, so with the technical stuff kind of out of the way, I wanted to move into some more specific email strategies. Um, I do want to let everyone know that I've included our year-end email templates as a handout for this webinar, so make sure that you grab those. Um, a lot of the emails I'll be going over are actually included in the, the template document that I've shared with you, and you can also find a schedule in there. So it's a really handy, useful resource. Um, you can use it to double check yourself or make sure that you have all of the key emails that you want to hit. As and we'll be talking about um, a lot of the emails that are sort of templatized for you in that document. So first things first, this is a schedule of essential emails you'll want to schedule for year end. Um, you'll want to do a general winter holiday email or several. Um, you can do Hanukkah, you can do Christmas, you can do both. Um, these are not a super high fundraising priority, um, but they're a really great way to harness the giving spirit of those holidays and also do a little bit of A-B testing, for instance, while getting some donations and showing your donors some love. Um, the final week of the year, as I've mentioned a few times now, is really the most critical, so we're concentrating on emails that you want to send on that week and outlining which emails you should send during that week. Um, Monday, you should send an email. Um, you're kind of setting the stage for the remainder of the week. So if you have a theme or certain messages that you definitely want to hit in end of year, Monday would be the time to introduce them. And beginning on Tuesday the 29th, we're in the most critical days for emails. Um, Tuesday, send an email. And again, it's an important one, but it's not the last email on December 31st yet. So this can be a really great um, opportunity to get some data, do some A-B testing so that you can opt optimize those December 31st emails. Um, Wednesday the 30th, you'll want to send at least one email, and this is a great day to focus on storytelling, which we're going to be getting uh, into in just a bit. Um, December 31st is your most important day, and you'll want to plan at least two emails to your whole list, so two blasts. Um, this is also a really fantastic day to do some segmentation so that you can really do an assertive push before the new year begins. Um, one email to kick off the day is recommended, and then in the PM, um, a shorter email that builds some urgency to donate since the deadline is approaching. Um, so obviously there's a week between this webinar, or a little bit over a week between this webinar and all of these dates. So this is not a comprehensive schedule. Um, these, this is a list of all the um, emails that you can't miss, but you can absolutely 100% send more emails than this. I actually recommend them. These are just the can't miss emails. Um, um, and in the next part of the presentation, we're going to focus on what kinds of emails you can send and how to build them so that you can take this schedule, take the types of emails and the different kinds of content we discuss, and build these emails for the rest of December, um, and, or at least tweak or add to what you've already got planned. Um, so the first type of email is something that all nonprofits do in December, which is an impact story. Um, an impact story is a framing device where you basically use the, uh, the story of a real person or in the case of animal shelters and rescues, um, an animal that benefited from your work to tell a larger story about the work that you do and why it's important. Um, impact stories are showing instead of telling. You're not telling people how important your work is and all the good that they do. Um, you're showing them. You're giving a real world example of an actual life that was impacted by your work. Um, and impact stories get people emotionally involved, which is also 
ultimately the biggest people reason people decide to donate because you hooked them right in the feels. You got them under the gut and you, you inspired them to give to your nonprofit. And impact stories are real stories. They have characters, they have a plot, they have conflict, and they can help donors really connect to the work that you do and understand the issues that your organization addresses. So a lot of people, you know, these big issues seem huge and incomprehensible. And what an impact story does is it really breaks it down to its emotional course so that your donors can wrap their heads around it and understand why what you do is so important. Um, so just as an example of, a, of an impact story, I'm going to play this video, which is actually not a year-end video, but it's a video from a chimp sanctuary in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo that participates in one of our giving days called Giving Day for Apes every year. And it's just a really awesome example of an impact story and the format you want to use. Um, the sound can sometimes be a little bit funny, so I hope this works. I just wanted to show a clip of it. I'm not going to show the whole thing, uh, but this is the story of a pilot who is flying an orphaned chimp to the sanctuary, uh, Luairo Primate Sanctuary, um, after his parents were unfortunately killed by poachers. So we'll just watch a few, uh, a short clip of this. Oh no, I lost it. Well, that was just a short clip. Um, it, there's a, just a little bit of music and it introduces the story of this chimp and his time spent with the uh, pilot who was flying him to the sanctuary. And it's just a really uh, great example of a, an impact story. So I will link to that in the, uh, the email that you all get after the webinar. All right, so uh, the reason I wanted to show that clip, and I'm sorry that it, it kind of, uh, I ended up backing out of it, is that it's a really great example of an impact story. And believe it or not, uh, there is actually a formula for creating a great impact story. Uh, first, you wanna start with exposition, which is basically who, what, where, why of your story. Uh, who are your characters? What is happening? When is this happening? And so on. Um, this pulls your donors in and sets the stage. Um, and then you need a conflict or a rising action. Um, and sometimes the two happen uh, simultaneously, which is basically just the thing that's driving the plot in the story. Um, in most cases, it's a challenge of some kind that your characters need to meet. The climax is the turning point in the story where your characters make decisions and the path to resolution becomes clear. Um, and the falling action is the path to resolving the conflict, um, which hopefully ends in the resolution, which is hopefully a happy ending. Um, so this sounds like a lot. You want to, this is, sounds like a lot to put into one email, um, but I swear you can do this in a very succinct way. I'm going to demonstrate it on the next slide. Um, but these are the pieces that make a story effective, having exposition, a conflict, a climax, and a falling action and a resolution. Those are the key pieces that you want to hit in an impact story. So here's my example impact story in about 150 words. Uh, meet Max. This is my exposition. Uh, Max is a rambunctious dog with big ears and an even bigger heart. So already, I don't know about you, I'm on board with a dog that has big ears and a big heart. We know who the story is about and a few things about him in just two sentences. He was brought to us in critical condition after being hit by a car. Max didn't have any ID tags or a microchip, so he had no one to rely on but our rescue. This is the rising action. This is setting the stage for the conflict. And this also adds in the rescue as a character. We knew we needed to help Max, but we knew it was going to be a long, expensive process to rehabilitate him. So this is the conflict. We want to help him, but it's going to be really time consuming and expensive. So we, the rescue, have a decision to make. We were able to tap into our Rover Fund, which provides care for dogs like Max who need extra care before finding new homes. All right, so this is the falling action. We've realized what the path to resolution is, and we're on the path to ending the story. Thanks to donors like you, notice the because of you messaging, who donate to the Rover Fund, we were able to keep Max comfortable in a foster home while he healed, name checking another important service that the rescue provides, 
under the care of our, vet, our veterinary partners. In November, Max was adopted and able to spend his first Thanksgiving with his new family. So that's the resolution, that's the happy ending. Um, and if this were an email, you might end with a question like, will you donate $25 so we can continue to help dogs like Max find happy endings? So you really don't need to write a novel to tell a good impact story and include all of those elements that we just discussed in your impact story. You just need to make sure that you include them, that you include the exposition, the conflict, the resolution, and bam, you've got a really fantastic impact story. And it doesn't take, you don't have to write War and Peace, you don't have to write a novel, you can keep it short and succinct and impactful um, and still have a great impact story with lots of detail that tugs at the heartstrings. So there are a few best practices to follow here. Uh, number one, you'll need more than just words. Um, so choose a story where you have media, like images, um, and ideally in a perfect world, you'll have images and video. Um, and you need to get permission. This is really important. Um, in order to ethically tell a story, you need to have permission from the person the story is about. So make sure that everyone who's in the story, you have their permission before you proceed with using them as an impact story. Um, and this is even more important, obviously, if your nonprofit provides services that can be sensitive, like people who are using a, a food bank or uh, services for specific health problems and information that people may not want to share with the world. Um, and finally, you'll want to choose a story that provides an accurate representation of your work. So for instance, if you have a really, really fantastic story, it's a cool story, but it's outside of the scope of what your nonprofit normally does, it doesn't work as a, a, an impact story because it doesn't tell a bigger story about your nonprofit. So you're telling the story that, with the characters and the plot, but what you're really doing is you're using it to illustrate what your nonprofit does. So if you choose a story that doesn't relate to the day-to-day -day services that you provide and you, give, you tell a story that was a complete outlier, you're not doing yourself any favors because you're not telling that deeper story about the work your nonprofit does and the lives you touch. All right, so moving on to the next type of email, you'll definitely want to build an email from a head honcho at your nonprofit, whether that's your executive director or your board chair. Um, for this email, you'll want their name on the from line of the email. That's something that you can edit in email marketing programs. Um, and these emails tend to convert at a high level because basically it makes people feel important to get an email from someone so important at your organization. And honestly, most people don't even care if it's obviously an email that you built with a, an email marketing program and you've got the constant contact logo at the bottom. They don't care. It still converts. Um, and if it's at all possible, you should get the head honcho this email is going to be from to draft it or at least have them approve it and make some edits so that it feels authentic and it's really from them because if you're anything like me, sometimes your voice becomes the overarching email voice and you really want this to be from your head honcho's voice. Um, there is a format to this kind of email, which I'll discuss in a minute, which is Marshall Gann's story of self, story of us, story of now, that will help you build this email in a way that hooks donors. Um, and since 2020 has been a real roller coaster of a year for reasons that are too numerous to get into in this webinar, um, this is a really great place where you can add in specific context about 2020 and the challenges that your executive director, your leadership, and your organization faced in 2020. 2020. All right, so here is the, the formula that I was talking about. Um, and if any of you have done executive training or executive workshops, this is probably something that you're familiar with. Um, it's a format created by Marshall Gans for public narratives. And you'll commonly see this format in speeches and presentations, which is essentially what this email is. It's a presentation to your donors from somebody high up at your nonprofit. So you start the email off with a story of self, um, which is, who are you? What called you to do this work and get involved in this cause? Why do you care? Tell us about yourself. So that, this would be your executive director talking about how they came to get involved in this cause and what brought them to do this work, what, what made them care about this issue. Then you move into a story of us. And in this case, the us is your nonprofit and the supporters of your cause. So you're talking about values that are shared with your organization and the people who support it. 
And then you tell a story of now, um, which is the challenges that you're meeting, what is needed at this time, what is required, and obviously, uh, which is obviously meeting your 2020 financial goals and being able to continue your work in 2021. Um, there is a template for an email um, from a head honcho in the template document that you all have access to. It's very short, and I highly recommend um, making sure that you fill in the blanks and really make that email come alive by following this format. So it's a little hard to templatize because uh, you know every every story is going to be different. But if you use this format and you kind of use the template that we provided as a guide, you'll have a really effective email from somebody important at your organization that resonates with donors. Um, and then obviously you want to have a CTA link or a CTA button in the email so that when you get to the story of now and you're talking about what is required and what challenges to meet, um, people know what to do. They can go to the link and they can make a donation. So a few tips here, and number one, uh, this is something you'll very quickly hear about if you mess this up, is to make sure that all of the bounce backs and out of office emails and replies are not going to your executive director or your, your board chair directly. So uh, don't use their actual email address. Uh, some email marketing programs require that if you have a from email address that it be a valid email address. So if that's the case for whatever program you're using, you'd wanna create a dummy account. Um, um, and if it does let you just uh, edit the text of who it's from that you would see in your inbox, you can just edit that text and have it go to your info at email address or wherever the bounce backs and things to your uh, emails normally go. Um, I've done that before. I've, I've actually uh, flooded uh, Mighty Causes CEO with some responses and bounce backs. And it's something that you will not forget to do once you do it once. Um, you'll want to use personalization variables in this email just so that it feels personal, like a personal letter to, to donors. Um, and on that note, this is a really great email to practice segmentation with um, so that you can make small tweaks that speak more specifically to the key segments that we outlined, like volunteers and recurring donors. Obviously, a, a best case scenario is if you're sending an email from your executive director to your volunteers, you want to acknowledge the fact that they are volunteers and do a lot of work for your nonprofit. Same for recurring donors and so on. So next up is an email with your 2020 accomplishments. Um, this is where you'll want to talk about all the good good work that your nonprofit did this year and share some key metrics of your success, like X number of people served or whatever uh, accomplishments you want to highlight. Um, this is a really great one for the last few days of the year um, because you're really driving home your impact and the importance of supporting your work. And most people are feeling reflective around this time, so it just tends to, to land really well with them. Um, and the key thing here is to use because of you framing. Um, I know I talk about that a lot, but it's very important. It end of year um, and just really hit the messaging that none of these accomplishments that you're listing, these incredible things you've done, would have been possible without the help and the support of your, your donors. Um, the easiest thing to do for this type of email is to take all of those metrics and create a visual. Um, infographics are a really great way to go here. Um, Canva uh, is a program and they have a lot of infographic templates that you can use to build an attractive infographic if you don't have a graphic designer or someone like that that you work with. Um, and the bonus is that that kind of graphic is something that you can easily reuse, put it on your website, put it on social media, you get a lot of mileage out of it. Um, so it's also important to really just pull out key metrics that show your accomplishments and not overwhelm donors with metrics that they don't understand or aren't likely to care about. Um, you're not putting together a report for your board. You're just talking to your supporters. These are average people. So if something wouldn't make sense or be meaningful to them, don't include it. You really just want to highlight um, the most important things that you want to communicate to your, your donors. Um, and I cannot stress this enough, I already mentioned it, but use because of you framing, because this is ultimately, it's a request for donations. It's not an email about how awesome your nonprofit is. I mean, you definitely are awesome and you achieved all these things, your staff, 
and your volunteers helped you do all of these things, but you're not trying to make the case that you're so great. You're trying to show that investing in your work is worthwhile. It gets results and that your donors are the people who make all of these these accomplishments possible. So you're really not talking about how wonderful your nonprofit is. You're talking about all of the wonderful things that you were able to achieve with the help and support of your donors. Um, so that's just really important because if you just list off accomplishments that make you look good, that's not likely going to resonate with your supporters. But if you make them a part of it and make them feel like they're a part of your success, then definitely they're going to be more driven to support you and donate and show more interest. The sister email to that one is one with your goals for 2021, um, which is where you tell your donors what your plans are and just make the case that they should invest in your work for 2021. Um, this is a perfect New Year's Eve email because donors are also thinking about the year ahead and you really just want to outline some key goals that will resonate with supporters like starting or expanding a new program or adding to your services. Um, really nitty gritty things are best saved for your your an organization's leadership, you just want to talk about the things that would be exciting to the, the average person who cares about your cause. Um, and basically what you're doing here is asking for buy-in. You're asking people to buy into these goals by making a donation. Um, these are really simple emails. They do not need to be complicated, but you can punch it up with some images and just share your excitement for what you'll do in 21. The framework is really that you just need uh, people to give and make a donation in order to accomplish these things. Okay, so this one is obviously a December classic. It's the countdown email. The email, this email is all about urgency and utilizing the built-in deadline of midnight on December 31st, or I guess uh, before midnight on December 31st to spur people to donate. Um, now you do want to be judicious about using urgency because you can end up like the boy who cried wolf when you, you overuse urgency if every single email from you is urgent, people are going to stop being sensitive to it. They're going to stop paying attention. Um, but this is an appropriate time to use it, especially on December 31st. Um, the tax deadline is actually a really great hook here, um, reminding donors that they will need to make a gift before midnight on December 31st to be able to deduct it from their tax returns. Um, now, the standard deduction was raised in 2018 so it's actually a lot harder to deduct charitable contributions because people have to give twice as much for the charitable donations to outweigh the standard deduction and make it worth itemizing instead of just taking that standard deduction. But the important thing here is that the vast majority of people uh, don't care. Uh, the reminder still works with them because whether or not they plan on itemizing, that it doesn't really matter. They feel like they're they're missing out or about to miss out on a deal. And that's what resonates with them and spurs them to action. So don't second guess it. It's, it, you know, people will do what they do with their taxes, but that reminder actually does help convert people for end of year. And it's a really perfect email to send on December 31st. So there are definitely a lot more emails that you can send than what I've outlined here. Um, my hope was that you could take the schedule that I put together and these types of emails. And if you don't have anything planned, you could sort of use it to fit those emails into the schedule based on what you think is best. Um, and also you can sort of use it to add emails if you had a, a more sparse schedule planned or uh, just you know change up an email if you wanted to sort of tweak it so that it uses one of those messages. So there's definitely more. And I just wanted to quickly go over a couple that you might want to consider for end of year. Um, the first is a donor retention focused email, which I actually would say that you probably shouldn't just consider adding, you should just plan on doing. Um, this is your last chance to reach out to donors who are in danger of lapsing and get them to return. Um, what I recommend doing is building out an email and then whenever you plan on sending it, going into your donor retention report on Mighty Cause, pulling the list of people who have not yet been retained and then plugging it into the email and sending it. Um, and if you do this earlier, in your schedule, you may wanna do a follow-up on December 31st just to get the people who have not yet made their donation, give it one last college try to get them to come back. Um, 
And if you partic if uh, somebody per if you did participate in Giving Tuesday, whether it was on Mighty Cause or elsewhere, it's definitely worth sending an email specifically to your Giving D Tuesday donors to show them some love and appreciation and ask again for their support. Um, these donors have demonstrated an interest in giving. Uh, they gave very recently, and they are highly likely to give again. Um, so you want to make sure that you reach out to Giving Tuesday donors if you participated in Giving Tuesday. Um, it, it, again, if you participated in a a, a fall giving day on Mighty Cause. We had quite a few this year. If they, per, if you participated in a fall giving day, um, instead of Giving Tuesday, follow up with your donors from that event because they've, they've demonstrated a propensity to give and it would be a mistake to miss reaching out to them. And last but not least, if you have a matching grant, uh, you will want to announce it and market the heck out of your ma matching grant. Um, a matching grant is a fantastic way to drive donations. I don't want to get into the weeds with matching grants in this particular webinar, uh, but it's actually not too late to secure one. Um, if you don't have one planned, you may want to tap your board for a matching grant or see if you can use their annual donations or their dues as a match. So there's still, pos there's still the possibility of getting a matching grant, um, and that's a really great way to drive donations while a matching grant is active and obviously if you have it you need to market it so if you do have a matching grant make sure that that's on your list of emails to send all right, so we are in the home stretch and before we wrap things up I did want to talk a bit about personal outreach um, so why can't we just send email blasts? I spent all this time detailing all of the work that's got to go into sending emails through your marketing program. But at the end of the day, donor relations is all about building relationships. And you can't build a relationship with an email blast. Um, you, re you build relationships with people. So in order for you know, your donors to build a relationship with you, you need to have a personal connection. Uh, people are also much more likely to actually make a donation when they're asked directly. Um, you know, sending an email, you're asking them, but having, you know, Susie in your development apartment contact something and say, hey, we really need your support is a much more effective way to actually get people to donate. Um, the other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that you want donor feedback. You want to know how you're doing and how they're feeling about you. So it gives you a chance to just talk directly to your donors and see how they're feeling, get feedback about your work um, and your fundraising. So it's just a really important conversation to have. And also it just makes donors feel seen and appreciated to have somebody personally reach out to them. So it doesn't need to be hard. Uh, personal outreach, and I've been in this camp before, it can be, feel really daunting, especially when you've got a really packed couple of weeks ahead of you. But here are four easy ways that you can do personal outreach. Um, number one, identify your donors for outreach. Um, so I recommend developing some criteria. You can't reach out to all of your donors unless you have a really small list. So think about who is the most valuable for you to contact. So recurring donors, donors who gave over a certain threshold in 2020, people who gave more, and then create a spreadsheet with their contact information um, just so that you have that on hand. But again, you don't have to contact all of your donors personally. You just want to identify donors that it would be a good idea for you to contact personally and just put them into a spreadsheet with their, your, their contact information. Um, Two, write a template. Um, so you, again, don't have to reinvent the wheel with each email. You don't have to write each email from scratch. Uh, you can draft a quick template. I use Google Docs um, of what your emails will say and then just personalize it. So if you know that a particular donor works here or cares about this, you can sort of personalize it with their name and some details about them that you can sort of copy and paste and use that as a jumping off point and that makes the workflow a lot more convenient. Um, and then just go through the list of donors. Um, once you've gotten yourself organized, it's actually not that hard to do. You can spend an afternoon doing it. And if you're really small and you just don't have the capacity, this is something that you can tap volunteers to do if you need to. Um, and you can also tap your other staff. If you don't have you know, development staff that are available, see if you have anybody else, anybody else at the organization who can help you out with it. Um, and then make some time for follow-up. That's the last step. Uh, so once you've set an email uh, you know, in your spreadsheet, track uh, you know, who's responded and who hasn't. Um, and if they haven't responded, then send a quick follow-up email before the end of the year. And then if anybody did respond, obviously be responsive to them um, and you know, respond to whatever they said to you. Uh, but this 
is just a really important thing to do. And in the digital age, we can sort of over rely on blast emails and tools that market for us and forget about the personal touch. And that's really important to donors. So it's definitely worth taking some time to do. And the last ad break, I just wanted to mention that we do actually have a Salesforce integration. So if your nonprofit uses Salesforce to track your donors, we now have an integration at Mighty Cause, which like the MailChimp integration is available to advanced subscribers. And again, you can get a free trial of advance if you wanted to try it out. So if you use Salesforce and this might be useful to you, it's a really great idea to just get a trial and see how you feel about it. Um, what you can do with the Salesforce integration is you can automatically create contacts, opportunities, and accounts. Um, you can create custom fields to keep your uh, donor data organized. Um, you can automate donor data management, streamline your workflow, and it basically just cuts out a lot of manual work putting things into Salesforce. Um, so we have this integration available. It makes it a lot easier for you to keep track of your donors and how you've contacted them and create follow-ups. So uh, Definitely, if you're using Salesforce at your nonprofit, this is worth checking out. And if you start a free trial now, you should have it through the end of the year. So uh, definitely check that out if you are a Salesforce user. All right, and that is it for today. Um, and I wanted to make some time for questions. That is my dog Cooper's Christmas photo. Um, so if you have a question, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel. Oh, and just to clear this one up, this is always a question. We we will be sending a recording out for this and you will have the slides accessible to you as well. Um, and the email template, if you didn't, it's in the handouts of your GoToWebinar panel. I can also include that in the follow-up email just to make sure that you have it. Um, but if you haven't already done so, you can go into handouts and download that um, that handout, um, but yeah, it, you can, uh, you, I'll make sure that you all have access to it. Um, let's see. Okay, so how do you incorporate Giving Tuesday with year-end if at all. So we actually did a webinar on this, sort of how you can sort of incorporate Giving Tuesday and transition. Um, I think, you know, it depends on how you handled Giving Tuesday. So a lot of uh, nonprofits, they just ran one campaign. For, so they started it on Giving Tuesday and they ran it through the end of the year. And obviously, if that was what your nonprofit did, um, you know, you, you're just continuing the campaign that you started on Giving Tuesday. If you're doing a separate campaign, Obviously, the way to include it is to contact your Giving Tuesday donors. Um, you know, talk to them specifically. They were the ones who gave to you. Um, and you can also incorporate some elements of your campaign in your end of year messaging. Um, so you can sort of make it feel like a more smooth and natural transition. Um, but the most simple answer is to just include your, your Giving Tuesday donors and make sure you're talking to them specifically using segmentation to you know, acknowledge that they gave to you on Giving Tuesday. And it's it's also you know easy easy enough to include similar messaging so that it feels connected to your Giving Tuesday campaign. Um, so hopefully it, we have our end of year toolkit, which is available. I think everybody who's an admin got an email about that. Um, I'll also include a link to that in the uh, follow up email, um, and that has some information about how to transition from Giving Tuesday into end of year and sort of make that feel natural and uh, normal for your donors. Um, let's see. How can you use the CARES Act and additional tax breaks to motivate people this year? So I would be really cautious with that just because you can't really dispense tax advice. So in terms of like how you can sort of advise them to use that, it's really tricky and you want to make sure, you know, if your nonprofit has a lawyer, check with them uh, because everybody's personal tax situation, they should talk to a uh, tax professional about. So I would say err on the side of caution when talking about specific tax breaks for people. Um, and if somebody does come to you and they want to use the CARES Act, um, I would definitely try to to refer them to a tax professional um, so that they can talk about whether their deductions or their donations qualify for a CARES Act deduction. Um, so that's something that can get you into a little bit of trouble. Um, I would probably try to stay away from that and just use a general reminder that if you want to donate, um, you know, if you want to claim a deduction, 
you need to make that donation before midnight on December 31st and keep it as general as possible just so that you don't open your nonprofit up to any liability. Um, but you can certainly mention it, you know, and say in an email if you're reminding them about the tax deadline and your donation may be eligible for additional deductions through the CARES Act, you know, caveat, you should talk to your tax professional about this. Um, but that can be something that you can certainly mention in the uh, the email where you're reminding them about the tax deadline. Uh, but I would just be careful about that. Just make sure if you do include any language, you might want to run it past <clears throat> a lawyer at your nonprofit. Let's see, this is a huge, oh, this is a long one. Um, this is a huge debate among our staff. The number of emails we send at year end especially, gotta love those staff debates. Um, what does the data say about unsubscribe rates if we email people every day in the final four to five days of the year? This feels excessive to me. So uh, as far as like industry-wide data, I don't, actually have that, what I would recommend doing is going back into your emails, your email marketing program and looking at some reports and some data from last year. Every nonprofit's different. So if you know you normally don't email your donors that often, it may be that a, an email every day is excessive and your donors will go, what the heck? Um, so, but the thing to keep in mind is, and I was told this in a training uh, for email marketing and it's really just stuck with me, is that unsubscribes are actually doing you a favor because the people who unsubscribe from your emails are not interested in receiving your emails. So they're doing themselves a favor and taking them off your list. If they're unsubscribing from your emails, they're not likely to donate because they're so uninterested that they don't want to even receive emails from you. Um, so unsubscribes are actually not a terrible thing. If you notice a spike in unsubscribes, uh, it may mean that you need to do more segmentation and reach out to people who are actively engaged in your nonprofit and open your emails and things like that. Um, if you want specific data, I would say look to your nonprofit's data. Go back to 2019, see how many emails you sent and see if uh, you got more unsubscribes. And generally speaking, if you're sending more emails, you're going to see more unsubscribes just because you're sending out a higher volume. Um, that is something that is going to happen. But it's one thing that it's, it's something that I think is worth a reframe in that, you know, they're doing you a favor. They don't want to receive your emails and they're just taking themselves off your list. So they're doing some list hygiene for you. Um, you're not really losing donors because you're losing a subscriber. There are a lot of people on our email lists who signed up because they used a, a service that we provide. They signed up at an event and they don't even remember who you are. Um, but these people, they're potential donors for sure, but I would not treat it as seriously as like losing a donor. Um, and again, it's, it's important to be, uh, you know, have a robust program to engage your donors. So hopefully email, marketing emails are not the only way you're contacting your donors. You know, you can always give them a call, make a plan to call people at end of the year um, and contact them in other ways, inviting them to events when we're able to safely do so. Um, but people are, I think, generally a little bit over-concerned about unsubscribe rates. They're just, you know, they're people who don't want to receive your emails. And, you know, it's not worth crying over spilled milk that these are not people who are likely to donate because they are uninterested and they are telling you that. Um, so yeah, if you send more emails, you might see a spike in unsubscribes, um, but I would look at your data just to see what happened in previous years and maybe compare it. You know, if you had, if you sent were conservative last year, try sending more this year and then you'll have some good data. But a few unsubscribes are not gonna kill your your nonprofit. So don't be scared of unsubscribes because what's more important is getting people to donate. Um, let's see. We're relatively new and still without a substantial list of prior donors. Um, with this in mind, would you invite, advise using these strategies or more or less cold contact potential donors? Um, so what you may want to do is I guess it kind of depends on how you are interacting with people as a nonprofit. Where are you meeting them? Are you meeting them at events or is it you're pro providing services? Are you mostly using social media at this point? Um, you may want to do a push to sort of get people to sign up for your emails. 
Um, certainly, if you're new and your subscriber list is not that robust yet, um, you want to probably be a little bit more conservative or, you know, even more do some more personal outreach and segmentation um, just so that, you know, you're, you're not wasting your time sending them a lot of emails to a really short list um, with a small list cultivating your donors by reaching out to them personally, um, depending on how small it is, um, can be really helpful. And then you just want to make a, a point of trying to grow your email list. So for instance, if you have a lot of followers on Facebook or followers on Instagram, uh, you know, put a link and ask them to sign up for your email list so that they are they're able to you know hear announcements and they're also getting your year-end emails um, but yeah if you're you're really new and you have a smaller list you may want to you know take an editing eye to that schedule and be a little bit more conservative um, but hopefully the list you have is super engaged and you know you can just use a variety of approaches with them to you know get them to donate. So you can try marketing emails, you can try personal outreach, and then in 2021, just, you know, take a, a focus, make a make it a focus to grow your email list. Um, but it's really up to you and how often you're contacting your donors anyway. Um, don't feel like you have to do all of these emails. I would say, if nothing else, sending an email on December 31st or December 30th and December 31st is probably the most high impact thing that you can do. All right, so that seems to be it for questions today. Um, if you guys have any questions that you think of after the webinar, I'm always available to you. My email is lynda at mightycause.com. That's Linda with an I, L-I-N-D-A. Um, and I'm always happy to answer any questions that you have. We will make the recording and the slides available to you, so you'll have that. And I will make sure that I follow up with a link or, where you can download the um, end of year templates so that you can make use of those as well. Um, so thank you guys so much for joining me today and talking about some email nipery with me. I really love this kind of topic. So I appreciate having you here and happy holidays. Have a great new year and happy fundraising.